Christina, do we have a quorum tonight? Yes, Vice Chairman Corcoran, we do have a quorum. Great. Uh, good evening, all. It's Wednesday, February 16th, and this is the meeting of the Palm Springs Airport Commission. Uh, my name is Kevin Corcoran. I'm Vice Chair. Uh, Chairman Dada is out of the country, so I'll be facilitating tonight's meeting. Um, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Scott Miller, can I ask you to lead us? I'll start for him. Scott, are you with us? I will do it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to its justice for which it's all, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Just a reminder that if you're not speaking, please put your, uh, your Zoom on mute. <clears throat> Christina, is the agenda posted? Yes, it has been posted. Okay, good. Let's take the roll call, please. Good evening, commissioners. Please take a moment to unmute your microphones at this time. Commissioners Adams? Present. Breslin? Present. Badillo? Badillo? I thought I saw Badillo in the meeting. One moment. He's here. He's okay, here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burke is excused. Vice Chairman Corcoran? Present. Commissioner Dada is excused. Commissioner Feltman? Here. Freemuth? Here. Hedrick? Here. Hughes? Here. Martin? Do we see Martin? Miller? Payne? Present. Commissioner Philbrook is excused. Pye? Here. Schmitz? Here. Suero? Here. Wheel? Here. Wiseman? Present. Thank you. So the agenda has been posted. Um, can I have a motion to accept the agenda? So move. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great, thank you. Christina, do we have any public comments tonight? Uh, Vice Chairman Corbin, we do not have any scheduled public speakers for this evening. Awesome. Let's look at the minutes that were distributed from last meeting. Uh, Vice Chairman Corcoran, we need to open up to public comment, see if anyone oh. else is here to speak. One moment. I'm sorry. That's okay. Anyone wishing to speak, please raise your hand now. We do not have anyone wishing to speak in public comment. Okay, just notice that Scott Miller is on. Let's show him attending. Thank you. Thank you. We had the minutes from last uh, last month's meeting of January 19th that were distributed ahead of time. Um, any changes or additions to the minutes? Okay, could I have a proposal for approval of the minutes, please? So move that we accept the minutes. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great, great, great. Um, introductions and presentations. Um, I will take the first step here. I want to welcome Kevin Weissman uh, to our commission. Kevin joined the last month and he's representing the city of Palm Desert. Kevin, welcome. And if you would take a couple minutes and tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, so I'm the director of operations for a small travel agency in Rancho Mirage called Trav Tours. Uh, our travel agency handles American symphony orchestras on their uh, international concert tours. Um, in addition, I recently completed my MBA at UCLA Anderson School of, um, School of Business in 2019, and uh, I'm a resident of Palm Desert for uh, about 10 years now. Kevin, welcome. We're glad you're with us. Thank you. Harry, are there any other introductions or presentations you'd like to make at this time? No, Vice Chairman. Okay. Let's go to the city manager's report. Is Justin with us? He was supposed to be with us today. I'm not sure if he couldn't make it. So, um, 
you can get him and SM if we need him. Okay, if we, Christine, if we see him joining, just give me a heads up and we'll go back to that point. Let's yes, move so on. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to the discussion action items. You recall from the last meeting, we had a long discussion about the Air Service Incentive Program and uh, someone made the comment and you're absolutely right. We were, in, we were supposed to vote and support to vote on this and support. So uh, uh, Harry, do you have any, just any other comments you'd like to make about this before we go back to the commission? Um, I think we exhausted questions last time, but if people have other questions before we uh, vote on this, uh, you're welcome to ask questions this time. But Harry, anything you share, any other additions? I don't have anything additional to add. I think from the airport perspective, we do think this will be a positive program to bring in new service and to help market our airport. So uh, we sure hope that the commission votes to move, to move this forward. Um, I do have a question, Kevin, Scott. Go ahead, Scott. Um, was this brought before the uh, um, publicity committee? Uh, of the commission in the last year or something. Would you mean the marketing committee? I mean, I'm sorry, the marketing committee, yes. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, is, da is Daniel the president of this? Yeah, no, it was not. It was developed between myself, working with Visit Greater Palm Springs and our air service development co consultant, uh, Avon Pacific. Ollie was on the, the meeting last month. Um, I'm just wondering, um, shouldn't this be, wouldn't it be more appropriate for the marketing committee since it, it's a radical, it's a change, significant change from the previous uh, program? Uh, shouldn't that go through the uh, marketing committee first? Uh, because I think that's one of the major um, responsibilities of the marketing committee and make the recommendations to the commission before we approve this. I think Not all things my knowledge, be, I would need to go to them. Yeah, it's. I don't think there's a precedent, Scott, in doing it for this particular issue, but in futures that may make sense. But uh, it's always come directly to the whole commission, at least the last time. But Peter, you have more history on this. Am I am I correct in that? You ask me. Yes, Peter. Yes, uh, I, I think we we can we can move uh, without it being first at the marketing committee. Uh, as long as the uh, entire commission uh, uh, has heard about it, which we had the presentation uh, last time. So I think we can vote on it. That was the precedent, Scott, and how it was done last time we saw this. But uh, it's an interesting idea. I think we should take the marketing committee. But for purposes of this, and I know in the timing with the city council, uh, we may not want to add that step at this point because we've all seen the proposal and had the debate last time. But for futures, I think it's a very good question to, to, to take or to make. Okay. okay, and I have one other question, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, in the report, it said that um, there was gonna be extra funds um, available for this as of March 1st. And I was wondering what those were and what the character of those were and stuff. Uh, um, so I wanted to ask Harry what the, you know, where, what those were about. Harry, Daniel? Yeah, I'll defer to Daniel on that because uh, it's, it's his budget. Extra, well, right now, the way it's written is landing fee waivers would be in effect on March 1st. However, we're not making city council for February, so but it can be retroactive, I suppose. But anyhow, fee waivers will be available March 1st. Marketing funds will be available July 1st to be, to be uh, timed with the start of our new fiscal year budget. Um, if an airline comes to us between now and then and wants to take advantage of this in a program, we could review the budget and see if we have funds available. But that's, but officially with the program, no marketing funds are available until July 1 to coincide with the beginning of the new fiscal year. Okay, okay, that's not exactly how the report read, but if that's the understanding, then that's fine with me. I thought uh, um, it, it led me to believe something different, but that's fine. No, that's exactly how it's written in a, in a program that, that was presented, and that's going to be uh, taken to city council as well. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Any other questions? Peter. I, I move to approve um, based on the presentation we saw at the last meeting. Do we have a second? Second. 
All in favor for moving forward, say aye. 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 Is anyone opposed? Please note that I uh, was not at the last meeting and I will have to abstain. Okay. And I'm abstaining as well. Okay. Anybody, uh, uh, no, or reject, rejecting this? All right, we show it passed. Thank you and thanks Daniel for your update on this. Uh, Vice Chairman yeah. Corcoran, excuse me, the uh, city manager is now in attendance. I just saw Justin appear. Justin, welcome. Uh, you. We jumped ahead while we were waiting for you, but uh, the floor is yours for the city manager report. Firstly, let me apologize for running a few minutes behind. I've been pretty much back to back all day and um, didn't intend to be late, but happy to join you this evening. Um, I haven't talked to you, I think, in at least the, the last meeting, um, I had a conflict. So um, by all means, if you have some questions, I can tailor comments that way. But by way of brief update, you know, we continue to see um, very low impact at the Access Center that may even be somewhat old news at this point. Um, last I checked, they had seen over 500 unduplicated individuals uh, with no significant secondary impact. You likely also know that the city is moving forward on design of a navigation center. That's a much more comprehensive um, service that will have substantial transitional housing on site that will be located in another area of town. It will probably take, um, I think, 12 to 24 months to really build. Um, it is in part a retrofit and intends to potentially utilize some modular construction to try to expedite the timeline. And I know one of our requests for assistance, uh, grant assistance to the state contemplates a 12 month build, which is very aggressive, I think would be hard to, to meet. But the bottom line is we are on a very fast track to developing that property and those services. We've already selected a service provider and that's Martha's who's also running the access center. So um, in all likelihood, um, in fact, I can't really envision a, a scenario where it wouldn't happen that once we open up that full blown navigation center that we would also move out of uh, the old boxing club. So that looks to be, you know, the temporary situation we envisioned at the beginning. Um, and sometime in the next 12 to 24 months as we wrap things up with that new facility, we'll likely transition the staff and the resources uh, over there. Um, other than that, I think the last item that I reported on by way of a memo was some of the strategic planning work follow-up um, I will have part two of that conversation with city council on the 22nd, that's next Tuesday. One of the things that came out of some of those visioning sessions was the desire to start having monthly study sessions on some of the larger items. So that is a, a, one of those first scheduled study sessions and our intent to kind of keep the focus on some of our uh, strategic priorities is that those would be somewhat recurring every few months. So, so what that meeting will do is, is two things. One, we'll finish the conversation on strategic priorities that will largely entail presenting some staff work plans associated with those priorities. So it breaks down those fairly big topics like improve homelessness into a variety of sub-level level tasks. It also helps uh, staff and council scale and meter or schedule our work a little more effectively as we can take a period of say three to four months take the tasks associated with the large scale priorities and kind of agendize them, so to speak. Um, the other component is we will revisit our process improvement, which was always meant to be the second major piece of our visioning sessions. So we're going to look at roles and responsibilities across the spectrum of role players. So that's residents, stakeholder groups, um, external partners, boards and commissions, staff and city council. And we'll, you know, I've outlined a staff report for those that have looked at it from the last time that this was agendized or, or the same staff reports available now, where we look at all of those component pieces that are all really um, what I'd say are a part of the decision making process and aims to kind of clarify how we maximize each one of those role players and also how we make sure that um, the handoff, so to speak, between those entities works. So one of the things we've heard from a variety of commissions as an example is that they haven't always been closely connected to the strategic priorities of council or maybe, maybe even more generally haven't heard from council or there haven't been opportunities to you know, confer, et cetera. So those are the kinds of things we'll be talking about at that meeting. We will likely also review boards and commissions 
It's even interesting that we call a couple of them boards and, and most of them commissions. Um, they vary in, in mandate, so it's reasonable that they would vary in size and configuration, et cetera, but there's probably more variability between them than we really uh, need. And so that review is intended to just you know, go back to the enabling ordinance, look at what it says, review practices, um, review the notes that we got from commission members about what is clunky or not working in those relationships. We had a similar meeting with staff that work with commissions to say how, how are things working and look to see where we can you know, introduce some new processes. Um, for sure, I think that will include some of the basic things like rather than just having an ordinance and sometimes bylaws that we would create things like a handbook so that new commission members were you know, um, onboarded more you know, um, in a more robust fashion than what we've historically done. Um, we want to make sure that there are at least a couple touch points with council every year. So that might be something like quarterly meetings between the chair and the mayor, annual meetings where we'd get together and present, um, you know, kind of progress reports. We want to make sure we maintain the cycle of establishing priorities that we set out this year where the commission first gets to say to council, here's what we think we should be working on. But then the council plays a role in saying, given everything we've heard from all the commissions, here's our final priorities and, and kind of keeping that connection going. So it's going to entail a lot of those component pieces. Um, I'll, I expect to get broad level direction from council Tuesday. Um, and some of that work it has really already started, including when we submitted and solicited feedback um, to, to the commission. Um, when we started the process with, with council to ask you not only what your high priorities are, but you know, what kinds of things we might look at in terms of process improvement. So, so we'll continue that over the next you know, couple few months, I think. Um, some of the things that impact our pace or even you know, internally, uh, we had a recent um, resignation. Our city clerk is going to be joining the city of Palm Desert. So I don't know if there's any Palm Desert representatives or residents here, but <laughs> our, our loss is your uh, gain there. Um, but, but anyway, I think that's, that's really the, the big things related to the airport and, I'm, and the airport commission. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Scott. Um, yes, uh, I've just got a couple. What do you think, um, um, Mr. Clinton, is the best way a commission can communicate any input in this process um, to uh, the council? That's a good question. I, I think initially that some of that input was provided when we solicited your input on what's working, what's not working, and kind of what the priorities are. I would certainly encourage anyone that wants to um, review the meeting to hear what council is thinking. Um, and based on that direction, um, we'll set out to do some of the review. Some of it is really probably independent of, you know, talking with commissions. So for instance, we're just going to make notes on the composition of each. Some are large, some are small, you know, et, et cetera. Again, most of the enabling ordinances focus on kind of advisory language, but some really have very um, more authoritative language. You know, that may be intentional. We may want to keep that, but we may revisit it. Some of the specifics about how the commission inputs probably depends on what comes from that analysis, right? So if we decide, for instance, that a commission that has um, a lot of, um, you know, more active language ought to be more advisory or and sometimes we might find that the actions of the commission still don't don't align quite with the enabling ordinance. That's probably where we'd want to engage and say, what is the fix here? Is the fix to shift practices? Is the fix to shift language? Um, I know in the example of the Arts Commission, um, they were doing a lot of things that aren't contemplated in the ordinance and they're going to propose um, new language. For, for the ordinance, or a rewrite, if you will. So that's how they're going to be providing input to the process. But that's probably a little bit because of their unique circumstance. So as we start to kind of conduct that analysis, I think we'll check in and see you know, what else we might need to do to, to have a broader conversation. Okay, and then the second thing I wanted to say is that I appreciate you and your staff um, and airport staff in the monthly updates we've received regarding uh, the use of the airport property, um, the, the boxing club, and, uh, and all the efforts, because I know several frequent flyers out of PSP, 
and no one has made any comments to me um, that there's been anything but um, business as usual. And so the crowd control and the security and the policing and whatever staff's doing, um, I think from my perspective, and I don't speak for staff and I don't speak for the commission, I'm just one member, um, is that uh, it's, it has not negatively affected uh, the airport or airport operations, as far as I can tell. So I want to give a big salute to the staff that's been working on this and all the trouble that was uh, taken to really make this work in the, in the short term that it's going to be there. Thank you. I, I will note that it's a group effort, including the input that we got from the commission that helped us kind of tune in to what could be potential <laughs> problems. Um, certainly, the council made an expanded investment in the partnership. The new provider, Martha's, is really probably primarily responsible because they're the ones interfacing with the, that group of unhoused individuals uh, every day. And then at the staff level, we really also tried to augment what they couldn't do to make it successful. So it, it, it took a little bit of everybody, but happy to hear it. Patricia. Um, yes, um, in mind with the fact that the uh, council is going through um, a review of the different commissions, I was wondering whether or not in order to give input, if we even need to give input at this time, where that places the planned retreat that we were looking to with um, our commission, you know, to discuss our priorities and where we were going with them. So right. where does that go? So, so what I think would make for a better process, but I have yet to propose this really specifically to council or discuss it with commissions. But I, I, I think we need to close the gap between kind of council strategic direction, um, staff's direction, commission's direction, and make, make that more integrated, right? So I, I do think there's a place for the commission to meet on its own and say, let's refine our thinking about where we should be going. But I wanna make sure that also makes it back to council. One of the dynamics that we experience, number one in Palm Springs, we try to do a lot at the same time. I mean, just, I can tell you an awful lot. As I put these work plans together in the next four months, we're going to try to move the ball on homelessness and reparations and climate change and College of the Desert and Bogart. And, and I mean, it's just, it's just everywhere. Um, and part of that is because we do have a lot of these, we have commissions and stakeholders that are really engaged and that have depth of insight, right? I may have talked about this before, but the, air com the airport commission's immersed in the airport. And, and you all are and should be asking the question, what else can we do at the airport? The council, on the other hand, has breadth of insight and is trying to figure out between the airport, between homelessness, between efforts to reduce crime or improve infrastructure, what should we be doing? So to, to kind of limit the friction that occurs when a commission might be going one way and a council is going that another, I think what makes sense is that whatever you do in that process, that it comes back, right? And that you say, council, here's what we see. Here's what we think we need to be doing in the next, whatever your time frame is, 12 months, two to three years, whatever. And that council have a, an opportunity to digest that, look at it along with what other feedback they're getting, you know, from other commissions and staff, and, and, and give some feedback, right? And sometimes that might look like what it looks like with staff. Like, yes, we want to do this, but no, we don't want to do that. Or please, let's only do this on certain conditions or based on a certain schedule. Um, so, so that's what I would envision. I think timing-wise, it would make sense for us to complete that process with council. And I think it would be advantageous um, that, that we brought on a new director. I should have mentioned we are getting close to establishing the final process. I'm working with the chair currently. I know he's um, out of town and right when he gets back, we'll be solidifying uh, the participation, the participants in that process. But I think having those two things done really makes a lot of sense because you want, you want a director involved in that and you want to know what, if anything, might change with the way our commissions are working. And, and in fact, some of those might even initiate conversations, right, um, that you would want to have in that same retreat type setting. So I think it would be ideal to wait for those things to be done before you have that retreat. I know that that, that was your suggestion and the communication you sent to us, that we should wait until the ED is appointed and then move forward with this. I just want to make a point. <clears throat> with, we have a lot of new commissioners 
who don't have the benefit of the two or three years that some of us have had here in the context of some decisions that have been made. Then you have the staff moving forward in prioritization. Their own, their own looking at priorities, how we're going to spend infrastructure money, that type of stuff. And one of the challenges that I think we have is that we don't have insight into that process, the staff work that's happening. And so when things pop up and Harry or someone else says, well, you know, the staff is working on this, but the commission is out of the loop. Um, that's creating the gap and perhaps some of the dissonance you're seeing. Just new people who don't know or even experienced commissioners who are not really sure what, what the staff is working on. So our intent in asking for this offsite is just to make sure we get smarter. So everybody understands what we're doing. And I think we can be more supportive in whatever context comes out of this process where you're going to give you know, more definition to swim lanes around how commissions are supposed to behave and how they're supposed to support city council thinking and decision making. So just we may or may, we may be different than some other commissions, but that's kind of where we are today. And our, our intent is to try to just get smarter and make sure we're aligned with staff so we can be uh, provide you know, better service both to not only the staff, but also the city council. It, it makes sense. And I think that's the same goal that we have and the same challenge that we all have. One of the ways that I'll phrase it to council, and I probably phrased it with you and other commissions, is what makes the process at the local government level so unique is how participatory it is, right? So we have all those role players I mentioned and more, residents, stakeholder and affinity groups, boards and commissions, um, external partners, sometimes with jurisdiction like the FAA, staff, council. Council also has sometimes subcommittees or, or they have individual relationships like they, you know, serving districts, plus council as a body. Commissions also have subcommittees. There, there isn't another model quite like that. And, and for that reason, I think of it almost like an orchestra, right? A lot of instruments. We have to be on that same sheet of music. The timing has to be exact right. The, the transitions have to be right, or we do get in each other's way. And, and we're always asking, what part of this is for staff without council, without the commission, without the resident? What part is the commission without staff, without council? You know what I mean? And then what are the parts that can only be done in conjunction or with a handoff? So it's all really the same problem and I think the same solution. So, and that's why I say I kind of recommend, I do emphasize council because they set the pace. They're, they're the only ones elected by the people and we all serve at their pleasure. So I also think staff and our prioritization and reorganization kind of waits and defers for them to set the pace. But I don't know that it's that critical that it's an exact perfect sequence as long as we're all very kind of aware that that's the challenge and that working it out is also like an orchestra where sometimes someone has to say, this is your role, you're coming in a second too soon, we need you to wait or, or something like that. And that that's not personal, it's to coordinate this more complicated apparatus, unlike our normal decision-making in most business and even most nonprofit worlds. So, so that is to say, if you guys end up meeting earlier with that mindset and with the flexibility that if one of the things you wanted to do or pursue, some of whatever impact comes from a new director or a council that we can pivot or we can kind of adjust and accommodate one another, you know, then, then I think that that works okay. I, I would probably still recommend the, the weight, but, you know, I, I wouldn't get pushy with anything like that if we're all on the same page. I think before we go to Peter, I think our, our intent is to wait. So I, I just, think that the onboarding process is going to be a lot more effective if we include a new executive director. So that that is the intent. I see. I see. And and yeah. and we will want help with that onboarding. I think that's one of those places where we can really use input from people, especially new ones that came in and and said, "Here's what I didn't get that was helpful." Right. I'm sorry, Peter. No, I would just like to make a quick comment. Um, I was a skeptic about the boxing club slash navigation set of. But I have to echo Commissioner Miller's uh, comments. I totally agree with him. I just wanted to go on record. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I recall some of our robust conversations. I really appreciated that you were willing uh, in writing a letter and kind of initiating some of that conversation to council to defer and wait and, and, and hope that we did well. And, and I'm glad to hear that, that we have. Uh, Any other Kevin? questions? Well, not necessarily. I just want to comment on your last thing. I agree with you in some way that 
Um, a new director was, was going to be very helpful in pushing some of the issues that I think our city manager is talking about, what the council wants. Um, on the other hand, though, I think there are issues that um, the commission has to make a decision in and of themselves um, that's irrespective of who the new director is. Um, you know, what is the actual role of the commission and what would the commission like to be its role? Um, you know, what is um, the, how does the commission operate and what would the commission, how would the commission like to operate? I mean, I think there's some of us who are new and I'm one of the new ones. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, so maybe I push the envelope a little bit more, <laughs> but um, I think those questions need to be discussed. And I know these types of meetings are very difficult um, because we have such a large commission and um, Zoom meetings are just not good for conversations like this. And I'm hoping at some point the council will allow face-to-face -face meetings, um, uh, but I think a retreat is needed and maybe it's two retreats. Maybe it's one retreat with commissioners saying, what do we wanna do as the commission? How do we wanna operate as a commission? How do we, you know, what do we view ourselves as the commission? How can we help council? How can we help staff as a commission? Then I think once we have a feeling of where the majority of the commissioners want to go, uh, then I think the um, new director can come in and say, okay, this is how staff sees the commission. This is, and council may even say, this is how the council sees the commission or something of that nature. And so, you know, the commission has kind of a mind of where it wants to go in a direction because I don't really have a feeling as a new commissioner that that's what we have. Um, and, you know, I mean, our, or, and I've read every ordinance we've done. I've read the old ordinances that we've have. I've read every single thing. And, you know, it's all very general, but they're always very general. I mean, that's the purpose of a good city attorney. Um, and uh, so, um, but I just think that the heart of the commission, I think we need to discuss that within ourselves. And, uh, and I know that some of the commissioners have been here quite a long time and maybe have that feeling, but as a new commissioner, I don't have that feeling. And we haven't had a, we have not had a vehicle to be able to discuss those feelings. Um, and I don't mind doing it in public session. I don't care about that, but I mean, you know, to, to really get where we are and what we want to do as a commission. So I'm sorry, I don't mean to take up your time, uh, Mr. Cliven. I know this is not your talk, but I just wanted to make a comment. Just, Justin, that's the work that you're doing, right? Your, your work right now is to try to define those swim lanes, not only for the airport commission, but for all commissions and give us more direction around what's, a, what's the appropriate way to be helpful in this process. Is that what you're working on? Yes, and, and, I, and I don't want to minimize the need for input from the commission in that process, but I also want to honor our organizational chart and serving at the pleasure of council, right? And so staff, sometimes, we have a very similar conversation sometimes. We want to be fully transparent with council about what we see and where we think we need to go, but we also want to kind of leave some space for the council to say, this is what we need from you. And, and this is where we think your, those swim lanes are for you, for you too, staff. Um, and, and so that's kind of the process we're following is kind of keeping them and their, I don't wanna say first attempt at this, but I think it's, it's different the way we're proposing it than it's been done before. To let them set the pace and lead some of that because really everything flows from them. These commissions are created by council, right? The, the staff and the organization created by council serves at its pleasure and and letting them kind of set some of that pace again nothing wrong with having organized thoughts and things like that um but but i don't want to say the the most important thoughts in the room are the councils but it but in some ways that that really is our system and and so getting their insight first and responding to that and filling in gaps and then maybe countering with an idea is how we're approaching it at the staff level all of our things in, in planning are flowing from what they tell us is, is the highest level priorities and what they want to see from us. Any other questions? So thank you for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate the flexibility. All right. I, I, if, you, if you don't mind, I'm going to step out. I, I do have a few things left this evening. Thank you all. Thanks again.
Okay, let's move on to item 9B, which is the, the turf conversion update. Mr. Adams, you have an update for us? Uh, yes, uh, it's basically everyone should have received in their pack at the uh, presentation by Tracy Sheldon. And it's basically uh, covered two of the main points that are going on right now. One is the demonstration garden. If any of you have been recently to the airport, you'll see the construction between the fountain and the front entrance uh, that's ten tentatively scheduled to be done by the end of February. Uh, when you go there, it, it, it's hard to believe it'll actually be done by then, but that was the objective be, to get the plants in and going before the extreme heat sets in. So that was the one thing. And then also, um, we have a five-year plan. We've discussed it previously with Patrick Tallarico from the Sustainability Office. Uh, he's no longer there, but um, they've now received uh, an update from the state drought emergency declaration as of January 4th that they'd like to advance some of the uh, objectives of our five-year program into a much uh, closer, a sooner calendar. Um, that's basically like the um, entryway by Gene Autry. You'll look at the diagrams and the photos in there. They've had some preliminary uh, landscaping ideas. Uh, that's something that has to be further refined. And also they're considering what to do as far as budgeting to pay to move up that timeline for, tor for the uh, turf conversion. Is there any questions? Any questions? The deck is pretty impressive. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. All good? Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay, it's time for the executive director's report. Harry. Thank you, Vice Chairman Corcoran. I just have a few things for the commission. The first, uh, I committed to briefing on noise. Uh, complaints to the airport uh, on a regular basis. Um, and so just to let you know, for the month of January, we had six complaints in total, two were general aviation. It looks like one was an engine run-up, one a low-flying aircraft, one a military aircraft, and then one a helicopter, which was flying in Indio, apparently. Um, so that's not too different from what we normally see month to month. Um, no significant increases for the month of January. Uh, in terms of airline use and agreement discussions, we did propose to the airlines yesterday that we would be moving their uh, airline rates to a hybrid rate me methodology, meaning that we would have a compensatory uh, rate scheme in the terminal uh, and a residual rate scheme on the airfield of the airport. Uh, what that essentially means right now under a residual agreement with the airport, the airlines cover the entire cost of operating the airport, and they get credited for that amount. Under a hybrid methodology, there would be a revenue sharing component where the airlines would receive 60% of the revenue, the non-aeronautical revenue, so anything from parking to rental car uh, rentals um, to additional leases, uh, and then we would get 40% of those revenues. So we proposed that to the airlines yesterday. Uh, we're still working through the negotiation process and moving forward with that, but with the hope that we will have a new agreement in place for the airlines in July. Um, next, uh, the airport's been in discussion with Clear LLC, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Clear, uh, but what they do is they help facilitate the TSC, TSA person screening process. Uh, so they use a biometric mechanism, usually your eyes or your finger, uh, your fingerprints, to get you through the biometric vetting process. And then if you have TSA pre-check or whether you're a standard customer, you then essentially skip ahead to the front of the line uh, to get screened through the TSA screening area. Um, we've been in discussions with Clear for about two months, uh, and we've actually uh, we sent this to the operations committee just to kind of vet this a little bit. Um, we're still working with how that's gonna be set up in terms of queuing. We have some queuing challenges just based on the design of the building uh, and what the TSA can accommodate and what they can uh, process in a given, in a given hour. Uh, however, we are moving forward uh, with trying to test that to see if that will work here in Palm Springs. We do believe there is a market for that. Uh, if you ask any one of our operations staff, they'll tell you they get that question three or four times a day, do you have clear? Um, and the answer is always no. Um, but we do believe there's a, both a local market and a regional market clear. So 
Uh, we're hoping to get them in here, test that out a little bit, see if that operation will work for Palm Springs. And if so, we hope to implement that over the coming months. Uh, and then finally, if you've been tracking city council actions, you may have heard last month that uh, we did uh, get approval to uh, increase the customer facility charge for rental cars. So we are moving from a per transaction rate of 450 to a per day rate of $9 a day for rental car uh, rentals. Uh, that's up to a period of five days, which is the maximum that state law allows. Customer facility charge fees, again, just to remind you, um, those go toward helping to build new rental car facilities as well as the conveyances, whether it be a busing operation or an elevator operation, transport operation, to get to that new rental car facility. Uh, we did get approval uh, to move in that direction. We have notified the rental car companies that we will be increasing those rates effective March 1st. Um, and hopefully that will help us continue in the process of designing a rental car facility uh, and addressing our capacity issues out to year 2040. So those are my updates. Are there any questions about any of that? I have a question. Um, I was wondering if clear is uh, uh, brings revenue to the airport or does it cost the airport to implement? Yeah, that's the important part I forgot to mention. Thank you for bringing that up. So that's actually revenue generating for the airport. Um, they would pay a per use fee to the airport uh, for their customers coming through the facility. Thank you. Oh, Harry. Um, what, what about the, the cost of installation of a, of a new lane in the pods? So who, who bears that cost? Part of our agreement with CLEAR, uh, and they apparently do this in airports a lot, uh, is they would, do, they would take the burden, the cost burden on for any construction or modification of the TSA lanes to make that happen. So they fully bear the cost of that. Thank you. I think that's great news that clear and palm springs are at least looking to working together to facilitate the airport experience for issue travelers and business travelers it's amazing news actually and that's exactly right we have a lot of leisure travelers who use it but we're starting to see some return in the business market so it makes sense to experiment while we can uh, with that product here at palm springs commissioner yes. adams does it reduce the uh, uh, current availability of lines for either pre-check or the regular passengers? Their proposal right now does not reduce the availability of queuing space. Um, so the idea is that we would turn one of our queue lanes, which happens to be the employee lane actually, into a hybrid lane for clear to use and operate on. Engineer, would that have any negative impact on the employee? Uh, pacing of being able to enter? We don't believe it'll have a negative impact, but that's part of the, the vetting process and the testing process is to figure out if there are impacts that we just didn't anticipate. Um, yes, I think I you, Vice Chairman Corcoran for I just got two, two questions, not specifically on this topic, but in our, in our earlier, our last meeting, there was a discussion around the timing, uh, the time it takes to secure bags and baggage claim. There's also some comments made around the uh, amount of parking available. And is the parking lot getting full and are we finding a lot of spillover and have there been issues there? Um, are there any comments on just the status of how fast bags are moving um, and, and any, and any uh, uh, action steps to address that? And what's the status of parking and uh, are people able to park easily? So I can address the second issue very easily. The first issue is a little more complicated. I think I mentioned the last meeting that a lot of the baggage return um, that goes uh, through our ground handlers here at the airport. Um, so depending on who an airline is contracted with, uh, they may have different services. Um, other, other companies may offer a little bit slower services. So, um, we do have some constraints, facility constraints themselves in the fact that we do have three belts. Um, you know, so if we have a large push of aircraft inbound, obviously there are going to be some delays there. We have not 
frankly track anything over 20 minutes, but obviously 20 minutes is a long time, you know, to wait for a bad return. So uh, we're still working with the carriers. We're still working with the ground handlers to figure out if there's a system to coordinate that effort, especially during our peak periods when we have a lot of inbound flights. I don't have any good answers for that beyond some, you know, improvements, physical improvements to the building right now, uh, but we're still looking at that. In terms of the parking situation, uh, over the holidays, we ran into some challenges, particularly over Thanksgiving, we ran into some challenges with running out of parking. Uh, I did have our operations uh, manager pull some numbers for today, uh, for the month of January. It appears we're hovering right around 50% capacity with our main lots and parking. Um, are there opportunities to expand in the future? Uh, I do believe we'll get to a place very quickly over the next couple of years where we, we will need to look for adding capacity in terms of parking uh, and looking at strategies, whether those strategies be, you know, creating a pre premium parking or economy lot, um, off-site parking, uh, potentially contracting with vendors for that, um, and then obviously planning, but planning is a much longer process. So uh, that's something we are looking into, but we are tracking. Um, right now, we seem to be okay. Uh, that's not to say that next month, that'll be the same situation. Got it. Other questions on this particular topic? Uh, I think Commissioner Miller had his hand up earlier. Scott, did you have any questions? Uh, well, no, I was just going to ask um, on the on some of these issues, would it be better to have uh, um, because this is like a large forum to have a lot of these questions asked and answered uh, by the airport operations committee um, and uh, uh, instead of, you know, seven, eight or nine of us asking all these questions that it goes to that committee um, and then comes back to the commission and, and can give feedback to staff on, you know, what they think and what the issues are and things of that nature. Now, I'm just wondering. I think from a staff perspective, absolutely, we would support that. Um, we, we can provide regular briefings to uh, the committee as they request them or, uh, you know, just a standing briefing if you'd like. Uh, I'd leave that up to the operations chair. Uh, we've uh, we've been in, in discussion with um, Harry and the staff on, on taking the uh, issues related to clear to the operations committee, and I think we'll probably proceed in that direction. I suggest that we could add these other two issues to, to yes. your agenda just to, to, to really follow up on the baggage situation and parking as well. It's a good idea. Any other sure. questions? So if there are no other questions from me, I will turn it over to Victoria. I know Victoria has been kind of working on um, taking some feedback from the commission in terms of uh, presentation of the financial, social, uh, and she's got some updates for you and I'll let her take that over. All right, thank you, Mr. Barrett. Um, can um, can y'all see my screen that says financial summary ending January 31st? We can. Great, thank you. Um, good evening, Vice Chairman Corcoran and members of the commission. I'll be reviewing the financials for the period ending January 31st, 2022. At the request of the commission, the financials have been modified to depict the airport's financial position. So please let me know what you think about it. All right, um, the customer facility fund tracks revenues related to the car rental surcharge and related planning consolidated rental car expenses. The CFC Fund 405 has a net balance of about 847,000. This is a 75% increase when compared to prior fiscal year. The next two slides will have a chart depicting the net balances for the current fiscal year and the actual net balances for fiscal years 2022, 2021, and 2019. The Passenger Facility Fund tracks revenues related to the Passenger Facility Surcharge and Debt Service Principal and Interest Expenses. The Customer Facility Charge Fund 410 has a net balance of about 2.3 million. This is a 1,400% increase when compared to prior fiscal year. 
The debt service principal and interest in the amount of about 2.5 million has not been applied to this account, but the airport is on track to fund this expense. Fund 415 tracks all the revenues and expenditures for operating and maintaining the airport. As a result of the increased passengers and flight operations, the airport fund 415 has a net balance of about 3.6 million, which is 300% higher than fiscal year 21. Below are two charts indicating the revenues and expenditures collected in fiscal year 2022, 2021, and 2019. The first column chart with blue columns shows fiscal year 2021, excuse me, 2022 revenue increased by 62% when compared to fiscal year 2021. The second chart in orange shows expenditures increased by 4% when compared to prior fiscal year. Slide five is a breakdown of the airport fund actual operating revenues. The airport did not request reimbursement on the CARES Act funds and the funding is available until May 10th, 2021. The pie chart below indicates the top revenue generators are the on airport rental car parking and the lease parking. I'm sorry, Victoria, did you say it's available until 2021? Did you I'm sorry, 2024. And I don't know if you could see my cursor, but um, there's a little asterisk there that says that the CARES Act funds expire May 10th, 2024. Thank and you. It indicates that the CARES Act does not have any actual revenues posted to it because we have not drawn down on the CARES Act fund. Slide six is the detail of expenditures for the airport operations and maintenance. Year to date, the airport has about a 10 million, um, has about $10 million of expenditures towards capital projects, which include the passenger boarding bridges, the ticket wing renovation, and the special capital projects. This amount changes year over year, depending on the approved airport projects. Slide eight is an overview of the cash the airport has on hand for the four different funds. For comparison purposes, the commission will now see the current fiscal year 22, fiscal year 21, and fiscal year 19 cash. Funds 405, 410, and 415 have a surplus when compared to prior year. Fund 416 decreased when compared to last fiscal year due to the ticket wing renovation. This chart indicates the total in-planed and deplaned passengers on a fiscal year basis. For the month of January, the airport had a total of 236,850 passengers, an increase when compared to the same time last year, but a, de a decrease of 14% when compared to fiscal year 2020. That concludes my presentation. Questions? Yep, I have a question about the CARES Act money. Um, so we're now down to a couple of years left until we can spend this money, which I believe is exclusively for capital expenditures. Is that correct, Harry? Um, that is not accurate for CARES. So each, each... So can you characterize that, please? Thank you. Absolutely. So each grant came with a different set of stipulations. I think CARES was the least restrictive. Um, so we could use that for most things, but capital projects had to be specifically approved by the FAA to use um, uh, the CARES grant. The other two grants, the ARPA and CRISA grants were more restrictive. Uh, we could only use those for certain things. So we could use those for facility hygiene projects to replace equipment for cleaning throughout the facility, um, upgrading systems that would help the facility operate more efficiently, et cetera. Uh, but they were very restrictive and prescribed in how we could use those sets of, those pots of money. Uh, and then the infrastructure grant, we still don't have rules from the FAA on how those can be employed yet. We're expecting maybe another two or three months before we can get rules on how we can use those funds. So, can, so now that we have it there with the expiration date, with the asterisk, can we get a breakdown of that, of what funds are available to be spent now and what our plans are for them? Because we've been now sitting with that amount sort of being presented to the commission for, I don't know, close to a year. 
And I think it's yes. it's an appropriate discussion of what we're going to do with those funds or if we're going to turn them back unspent. Yes, now, absolutely. We want to get to the end and here we're turning them back unspent, not having any commission discussion about it. Absolutely. We, we can certainly get your breakdown of that. So one of the things, well, there were two things we were doing uh, for the last year and a half. The first was we were concerned about where COVID was going. So we were really kind of holding those funds in reserve unless we absolutely needed it. Because we didn't know if the government would, you know, essentially a lot more tranches of money for us to be able to use further down the line. So um, we were using some of the CARES grant to offset our operational costs. Uh, but for the most part, we were holding those in reserve until we knew for sure that we would be able to survive this without needing to make some serious adjustments to the budget. Um, the second thing we were trying to do, and we actually got an answer on this just last week, uh, was get a legal interpretation of how we could use those funds relative to our residual agreement, the agreement I talked about a little bit earlier with the airlines. We just received that answer last week. It looks like we have a little more flexibility than we thought we would have in the use of those funds. Uh, and so with that information, our staff internally intends to go ahead and move forward with planning, um, you know, planning how those grants will be allocated and certainly with the uh, input and inclusion from the commission. Okay. Um, my other item is I uh, very much appreciate the progress being made on the reporting. But I also do want to say that there are other members of the commission and, and the budget committee who have specific ideas and requests. And um, I don't think it's, um, or I just, I say, I think, I think it's appropriate that it not be first in, first out. So whoever gets to Victoria first gets the changes. And then, you know, if you hadn't gotten raced to, to, to their, to that destination first, you know, it's like, oh, sorry, we did this already. Um, we, I think as a commission um, should have a structured process. Change is great. I'm all for change. I think there's a lot of legacy items from prior executive directors who wanted things done a certain way. And there's plenty of opportunity for change, but it can't be like, sorry, we did this already and it's done. I don't think that would be appropriate to the commission as a whole. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that comment. We understand it. And uh, we certainly look forward to working with you all to, to tighten up that process. Thank you. Any other questions? Scott? I also want to share um, that what David said that I, you know, I look for. I mean, I'm glad uh, I see some progress in the financial reports. And I think it's great. So thank you. Uh, uh, Victoria and Harry for, you know, moving forward. And I agree with them that there are other tweaks we'd like to see. And I think that's uh, wonderful. One question I did have for Victoria was that, okay, we're, we're in February. Um, so we're about uh, two thirds of the way through the fiscal year. Um, and what do you see, or Harry can answer too, uh, what do you see? Are we going to meet the goals of the fiscal year 21, 22 budget? Are we going to be under? Are we going to be over? What's your kind of best guess? And I know it's a guess because you still have three or four more months of the fiscal year, but uh, you know, what, what, where do you think we're headed to? I'll take that one unless you want to hurry. I'll, I'll let you start and then I'll go. Okay. Um, so it's, projecting that we're going to be um, in our revenues, we're gonna exceed our revenues and we are going to be under on our expenditures. So that's actually always good. And yep, so- That's great. The, to help kind of form that question a little, Commissioner, what we tried to do uh, this year and what we did frankly last year was try and keep cost neutral uh, and be very conservative in our spending. So we, our hope was to come in under budget for this year. We think we'll come in under budget or near budget. Um, but what we didn't anticipate was a substantial increase in passenger traffic for the last six months of the year. Um, and so that was a surprise to us, a happy surprise, I guess you could say. Um, and we expect to the, end the in positive territory. So do you have plans then on, uh, because it does look great, 
um, on what you would use that extra money for? Are you formulating those plans now and then bringing it to the budget committee then? So we did, so while we were ahead for the last six months of the year, we, there was a shortfall for the first six months of 2021. Um, so at the end of the day, we're, we're basically tracking where we were in 2019. Um, I wouldn't say that we have a lot of excess revenue uh, to use, but we are still monitoring, you know, where those revenues can be applied, the, the, the revenue that we do have, where they can be applied to make things more efficient. One of the things that this staff is looking at internally is obviously with adding personnel. Frankly, we've been personnel starved for years um, and it's really becoming a problem to be able to operate the airport without the staff support to do it. Um, also along with that is automating processes. Frankly, balancing that, add, that addition of personnel with adding automation to help us do things better. Um, and get process improvement in place. So right now we're focused on the operation, but obviously later we would like to focus a little more on the infrastructure, uh, customer experience component of this. Okay, thank you. Can you, tell us how many, can you tell us how many open positions there are at the airport right now? So we have 50, just over 50 FTEs. I think it's 52 FTEs. And up until recently, we were down about 12 positions. And what's the impact of that? Uh, most of those positions were on the maintenance side. So we've been struggling uh, with our maintenance personnel in particular and staffing shifts. Um, it's been a challenge, particularly with facilities upkeep, uh, the cleaning and janitorial uh, aspect of it, making sure facility stays clean. Uh, in terms of maintaining the systems, we haven't, we've had shifts where we've had to go without maintenance personnel, put them in on-call reserve, and then bring them in whenever a system fails. Uh, some of our personnel, frankly, have been working 13, 14 hours a day, or 13 or 14 days straight. Um, so it's really been a challenge just keeping uh, the operation staff related. So Harry, why do you think that's happening? Is it because uh, we're not paying enough in positions? Is it because uh, we're not doing an effective job in personnel or recruitment? I mean, why do you think uh, that's occurring? There are a combination of factors there. So the first is, uh, as I mentioned, we've been, the airport has grown around us. Um, personnel and the staff, the organization has not grown as quickly. Um, the last administration was very adverse to adding staff because it would increase costs to the airlines. So um, the idea was that if you had the people, just figure out a way to get the job done with the people that you have. As a result, five, 10 years later, uh, we're now having to figure out how to backfill some of those positions. The other thing is, uh, and this is a real thing, the great resignation. Campus-wide, not just with airport staff, but also with the airlines, concessionaires, rental car companies, we're having challenges just keeping personnel. Uh, and we're having to shift our, our mindset from a recruitment uh, mindset to a retention mindset. And how do we retain the personnel that we have and the institutional knowledge to keep going? Uh, and then frankly, obviously, the salaries haven't kept pace with with the conditions out there. Obviously, inflation is a thing. That's one thing I mentioned to Victoria and Daniel this morning is we need to account for uh, the increasing inflation nationwide and here within the local area and figure out how do we address that. So there's a confluence of factors there. Okay, anything else? Victoria, thank you. Uh, appreciate the improvements, uh, more to come. I know that uh, you have meetings with David's budget committee coming up. Good luck in all that process. And thank you all for your help with this. Thank you. Okay. Let's I move forward, you. if we could, please, to the marketing committee. Daniel. Daniel, we can't hear you. There we go. Now can you hear me? There we go. Go for it. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see you again. Uh, I have a short update for this month. A couple of exciting things. So uh, first up, why is that not moving? 
close my okay hold on one moment apologies there we go all right so first up a couple air service updates uh american has dropped in a few flights per week into lax from palm springs uh, it put, put that on schedule a couple weeks ago. It's only scheduled for the month of April. It's not scheduled to be on that point. Uh, from my understanding, it is a repositioning of an aircraft they need to get from Palm Springs into LAX. And so instead of just flying it as a ferry flight, they're flying as a live flight and putting passengers on it. Uh, I believe that's something to do with uh, SkyWest maintenance base, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, Alaska has extended their Austin schedule to June 3rd. Previously, when they first announced it, it was actually set to end in mid-April. But due to good performance and their happiness with that route, they've extended it to June 3rd. So hopefully we might be able to work with them, especially with the new incentive program, and maybe convince them to turn that seasonal route into possibly a year-round route. Uh, yesterday, Swoop informed us they're going to take their Edmonton route to year-round, which is wonderful for us. They currently operate that two times per week. Um, they're going to take it to one time per week, one flight per week in the summer on Saturdays. That takes us up to 16 year-round routes on nine different airlines. To put this in perspective, in 2019, which was the best year on record for the airport passenger-wise, we had 10 year-round routes on six different airlines. So currently right now in season, we have 30 service to 35 airports and total 13 airplane, airlines watching are operating at this time. Uh, next up, I just a preview of scheduled departing seats for March through May. Uh, if you look on March, uh, compared March of this year compared to March of 2019, we were down 0.9%. But if you guys remember last commission meeting, I gave you guys an update on January and February as well. They had a decline. Originally going into 2022, we were scheduled to be up and have a really good start to the year. But with the new COVID variant, there's a lot of uh, frequency reductions from carriers, specifically from Canada, that caused us to go a little negative compared to 2019. However, we're still pretty much neck and neck with it. April's looking great, 14.2% higher than April 2019. May is even better at 31.5% increase over May 2019. Going on forward, if schedules hold, we should have a pretty good summer. What's great now, though, is with having the more airlines and having 16 year-round routes instead of just 10, uh, we will now, our, our summer valleys of our service, so to speak, will be shallower than they have been before. So hopefully we're trying to flatten out that curve and curve in a, and uh, make our service um, into not a Palm Springs more year-round and not and less seasonal on that. So we have definitely a uh, better service for the locals and our businesses as well. Uh, let's see what's up next. Oh, that's it. It was short. <laughs> Any questions, anybody? Questions? So, Daniel, those were projections for 2022 in April and May, right? Uh, not, well, see, if you physically look there, that's what's currently scheduled. So, yes, as long as the airlines, if the schedules hold and they don't reduce frequencies for whatever reason, that's what we're going to have. Okay. I just wanted to, okay, I understand that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 You're welcome on that. Everything I present. So I pulled that um, from a program that we have it's called DO is from a company called Sterium. And so they pull all the different schedules from all the carriers from around the world. And so we can look at there. That's what, so the carriers file their schedules every Monday. And so this is actually the schedules that the airlines produce. Other questions? Daniel, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, we're moving on to the next, which is the concessions RFP and an update. And uh, Harry, would you like to introduce our uh, consultant to this conversation? And I'm happy to uh, lead the Q&A, at least getting us started. Absolutely. So on the line, we have Wally, who is from Team Steer, who's a subconsultant to Rotondo, and he's here to answer any questions about the RFP that we sent out to the commission, I believe it was a couple of weeks ago for review. Um, and Kim Baker, who is with the city's procurement depart uh, department, is also available to answer any questions about the specifics of city processes. So I'll turn it over to Victoria and Kim and Wally to speak on um, anything they may have to offer or for the commissioners to ask any questions. Either. So just, just to provide con context before we jump in, um, I think I'm sure Harry has advised you that we sent out the draft RFP we ask commissioners to provide questions. We've shared those questions with you. And uh, I put them into different sections. All this has been shared with the commissioners. So perhaps we, it'd be helpful just to get an overview, present, and then we can go through section by section. Could that work? 
whatever works for y'all. Um, and just let me introduce or reintroduce myself. Um, I used to be with Ricondo and I was a concessions consultant to PSP back in the old times before the pandemic. And we got pretty close to having a, a solicitation back then. Um, so I'm not new to the airport. In fact, I, I did present at uh, a, a meeting that was attended by a lot of airport commissioners about two years ago. It was a, it was a community outreach hearing. And I wanted to just say, you know, if, if there was one thing that I picked up from that meeting, it was that it's important for the commission and the community that local brands and local participation occur as much as possible in the in terminal concessions program at the airport. So um, that message was received. Uh, evidently it was not articulated well enough in this draft RFP that, that y'all reviewed. Um, on the subject of it being a draft, a lot of it was taken from the old RFP, comported into the, you know, the new um, way of, of, of how Kim is, is preparing the procurement process. And so certainly, obviously, a lot of things are out of date. We are in the process right now as a group with Ricondo and, and the procurement department and the airport department of updating the stuff that clearly needs updating, such as air traffic activity, um, such as recent developments at the airport, um, data from the Visitors Bureau, and uh, a, a, a sort of a seismic change in the business model that can, uh, of airport concessionaires. Um, as much as airport operators and airlines have suffered during the pandemic, concessionaires got hit even harder. Um, and so uh, their, their business model has changed and we're trying to figure out well, what's the what's the right opportunity to communicate to them that will, that will get them interested in doing business at your airport because some of them are, are pretty um, over leveraged right now. So that was my little introductory spiel. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Victoria or Kim wanted to chime in on that or we could just jump into the questions. Victoria, Ken, any comments before we jump in? He probably did a good job in introducing it. That was the main thing I wanted to make sure you guys knew. We gave it to you very prematurely just so we could go ahead and start getting that feedback or input. And we're certainly going to go through it together and make sure we get a good product to put out on the streets so that we can hopefully attract the best um, companies to come in and run the concessions going forward. Sounds good. Well, the biggest concern I think that came out of the draft, and we understand this is a preliminary draft, um, was the disconnect between the 2019 priorities and what's in this draft. And that's specifically around the uh, statements, the communication, the content that uh, encourages these national players to partner with local brands. And just based on what you've said, Raleigh, is that message loud and clear? Do we need to, to reinforce it anymore? That's really important to us. It's an outcome we're looking for. I know it's important, and I think it may be the most important goal uh, for the community um, uh, trying to get the right outcome out of this process. Um, so message received, message was already received. It just wasn't in the document you got to review. Um, got and so I think one thing that we're trying to get clearer on is, um, I, and I think this is, this is sort of where we're, we're headed based on the, the last call I had with Victoria and Kim, um, was to uh, introduce the opportunity with the, the city's goals of what they want out of their program, what they want out of this procurement process. And then those goals will be reflected and underscored really throughout the document, but, but really it, with the evaluation criteria. So, you, so we'll be able to draw fairly straight lines from the goals to the evaluation criteria. So in part that's so the city gets what it wants and the community gets what it wants, but also so that the proposers know how to put together a great proposal, one that will appeal um, to the evaluators. So uh, we wanna make that clear. That's that's my role here is to, is to help the city um, uh, make that as clear as possible. Great. Just for, for context for those who are new to the commission, 
Um, when this RFP went out in 19, there was a lot of discussion around local brands and could they do it. And we quickly learned that a lot of local vendors didn't have the financial resources to make a long term commitment. Um, and especially with the infrastructure required for food and beverage, even for the retail for that matter. And so what happened was that the four, that four major brands, including Paradis, who's the incumbent right now, um, partnered through either direct contact with local brands or through other marketing re uh, resources that helped them reach out to local vendors. And they were all packaging a proposal that included local representation as part of their umbrella plan, these four major players. And we were down the road on this and then COVID hit and everything went sideways. So there was momentum based on how these four major players were reaching out um, that we think would have achieved what our goal was, was local representation at the, at the, uh, at the airport. So Rally, a question to you is, do you anticipate, are these four major players or other major players, um, are they based on where the world is today? Um, do you anticipate that this particular opportunity will be of interest to those and we would have a similar type of reaction as we did in 19? Um, so I'm not as confident as I was back in 1920, to be honest. Um, <coughs> so some of, some of the um, major concessionaires got out of it or, or are getting out of it worse than others. Um, a lot has to do with things that are sort of outside of our control. And I'm not talking about the pandemic, I'm talking about what all the other airports are doing. So um, Palm Springs being a growing, but still a small hub airport um, may not have the, um, may, may be back in the line behind some of the larger airports that may be issuing RFPs at the same time. Now this would be a, a normal concern. However, because of the pandemic, a lot of other airports provided some sort of remedy to their concessionaires in the form of extended term. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And so all of those are going to come due 2022, 2023. So the next two years are going to have many more uh, RFPs out on the street for airport concessions than would happen in a normal year. And that's because we had basically none in 2020 and even 2021. Um, there were some in 2021, but not a lot. So the, these companies, uh, the major concessionaires, they, they furloughed a lot of people um, at the top and at the bottom. And so their bandwidth to respond to all of the RFPs that hit the street is limited. Limited in a good year, but very limited now that they're emerging from, from COVID. So um, it is my hope that all of the major operators respond and I will be reaching out to them um, to, you know, before issuance uh, to make them aware that this is gonna be coming to hit the street. Uh, there's a conference in Orlando um, in uh, a two weeks time that's focused on concessions. And then there's another one that's focused on, it's called the Business of Airports and that's in Phoenix in June. Um, maybe this gets issued before then, I don't know. But those are some obvious opportunities for me to directly reach out to the concessionaires, big and not so big, because uh, they'll all be there. But and then I'll also reach out one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Sounds good. Hey, commissioners, be patient. I'm gonna try to bang through these questions and I'll open it up for more comments. So let me just see if we can quickly get through these big buckets of questions. Um, Raul, you'd mentioned the selection criteria. One thing that was a surprise to many of us was that brands and concepts, um, and when you look at the five different criteria that would be evaluated, the brands and concepts, um, and this is on page 38 of the RFP, um, was only uh, listed at 10%. And for some people we thought, if local participation is a priority, um, why isn't this um, worthy of a higher rating or a higher percentage in terms of the evaluation criteria? is that was the number assigned to it by the prior regime. Um, we have new airport management um, and you know the airport commission uh, has some new members and uh, city council has some new members. Uh, so you know, if, if, if the weighting of the criteria uh, should change, that is, um, I, I will follow y'all's lead on that. Um, 
you know, and and we can sort of reword brands and concepts to to bring forth, you know, let's just mention the word local and and, and try to um, underscore the importance of that. Okay, so that's a recommendation we can make to city council in terms of the criteria for evaluation. I think I don't. Well, I, I'm I'm not the local here, but I think it's it, it's um, the procurement department and airport department would be the ones composing this. I don't I don't think it becomes a council item until it's done. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, John Payne, are you online? Uh, John uh, it just texted me. This is Scott. Um, and uh, he's having some communication issues with his phone. He can hear, but he can't be heard by us. So he can hear things, but uh, he can't talk. So I wanted to let you know that. Um, Commissioner Payne, you may need to press star six on your phone to unmute yourself if you're muted. And I received his email. Just, I'm, I'm familiar with his comments and-, and Okay. Happy well, let me just see. Uh, Commissioner Payne comes with, with an extensive experience at San Francisco Airport and others. And he had a series of questions that was listed about, you know, what did we want from this, from a business perspective? And he included a lot of questions around, is it revenue? Is it inclusion? Is it customer experience? Um, you know, when services are going to be available, other metrics around concessions, um, et cetera. Any comments just about whether we should more clearly define the business goals that we're looking for in this RFP? Sure. So I think um, I think he is in a in a different sort of package of recommendations. Was uh, I, I think not not to speak for him, but I think he was he was approaching this. Um, with precisely the same issues in mind, but in a different way. So um, one goal uh, perhaps is um, generating enough revenue to support the airport enterprise. And then that would be reflected in the uh, pricing and financials evaluation criterion, as an example. Um, for customer experience, that would be um, that would be um, facility design and quality of improvements evaluation criterion. Probably it sprinkles around all of them, really. But but if we say that as a goal that we want to have a, 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 a customer experience befitting uh, a a you know first class tourist destination, then that's the goal, and then that's reflected in the evaluation criteria. So, so I, 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 would, I would take a lot of what he said and say, you know, these are some goals that, that will probably be arrived at in some way or another, and then they will be reflected again in the criteria. Um, some of the things are, are extra specific for um, uh, scoring purposes, like say um, hours of operation. Um, that's, that's more, I guess that's a more of an operational detail than say, a, a, an aspirational goal of what you want out of your program. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yes, I think the integration of technology is very important. Uh, that's that's really a, it, it's sort of always a trend, but it's especially a trend now that we've had this crash course in mobile ordering because of the pandemic. People are much more comfortable ordering food, goods, services over their phone. And in an airport environment where people are already staring at their phone, uh, it just seems like a natural uh, expansion of that you know, technology to be integrated into that experience. So um, that's something that we will we will uh, say in the RFP, and then expect the um, the concessionaires who are also you know hip to this to 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 respond in kind. Great, great, John. I hope we've represented some of your questions, and we'll give you more opportunity to follow up on this after if you want. Um, one of the commissioners uh, sent a diagram of all the locations and asked specifically about the green oval um, <clears throat> that's in one of the diagrams in the draft RFP. And the question was, uh, what are the plans for this space? And Harry, you can jump in if you have a point of view about this. Um, have we determined that it's too hard to develop? Is there any point of view about this? And again, for those of you looking at the questions, it's the diagram 
um, that was there with the green oval. Okay, so um, short answer, yes, it, it, it is too hard to do. Um, and when we were looking at this two to three years ago, we could not arrive on a good estimate of how much we thought that would cost. Um, it's a sort of a, a, an annex of space from the apron to the public facilities of the uh, terminal courtyard. And, um, and we, we just couldn't get a good number um, that, so we, we couldn't confidently convey that. That was then. Now, um, going back to the uh, flimsier financial position of all these major concessionaires and the smaller ones, frankly, um, they're going to be um, much less interested in building out as much space as I think they should. So having, having an, another um, a zone of concessions be built out from scratch because there's there's there be limited existing infrastructure for concessions already there. That would be prohibitively expensive for this opportunity. Um, and then finally, if y'all are a growing airport, and uh, even though I'm an advocate for air, an airport's commercial program, I have to respect the needs of of the aeronautical facilities. And um, I don't want to um, kind of uh, take off the table um, some valuable piece of infrastructure or real estate that could be used for aeronautical purposes or support services um, as you all continue to grow. Because at some point, not tomorrow, but if, I think a few years from now, you all are going to have to look pretty seriously at, you know, how, how do you how do you expand your facilities? And that's right in the heart of your existing terminal facility. So I think keeping that a fallow field is, is prudent for that. Okay. Um, there was a lot of questions around the timeline for the concessions contract. We were very, very concerned that the vendors have enough time, both local vendors as well as some of these national players had enough time to understand the RFP, to work together so that city council could uh, award this contract in December of 22 which would give five months for the successor um, to work on their plans and to you know, kind of jump into the game running in May 1st. Um, <clears throat> you'll see from these questions, there's some questions around, you know, is this realistic? And can we expect, even with that lead time, if the decision is made in December of 22, um, what can we expect the successor to be able to do on May 1st? And uh, should we tweak expectations? We hope not, um, but, are there other, other expectations we should have based on this timeline? And we're talking May 1st, 2023. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, so I think it's realistic. Um, I think if there's a risk factor, in my mind, it will be um, the, the design approval process, because that's something that I don't think has been tested uh, recently at PSP. Um, so if there's anything that the city or the commission can do to, um, you know, provide some sort of uh, guidance or, or even a document as to how that, how that process should go, you know, will, will there be, you know, or is there, is there a, a, a dark cloud of like a, a year and a half of architectural review board hearings? Or is this something that can proceed um, as quickly as, say, the, the ticketing wing expansion did? Um, so that's that. That in my mind is a risk factor. Um, but you know, these concessionaires are used to uh, turning around units in very busy airports uh, in a small amount of time. Uh, so they that's that's their that's their expertise that they can bring to this. That I think a normal construction firm or, or design firm may, may not. So they sort of have some concepts um, and some uh, methods of, of doing construction in tight spaces that are abnormal. Um, um, and because that construction would be taking place largely uh, in your down season, um, then that would make that e a little easier. 
Um, so I, I do think it's achievable. Um, and um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, my, that's my response. We should, uh, we should really include that in and work with city council or city staff to figure out how this process will move through architectural. That's a good point. Somehow we should confirm that process in the RFP. And so the city's part of that whole thing. Um, last question before I open it up to our, my fellow commissioners. There's no specific language against LGBT discrimination. I know there's reference made to page 111. And the question was, well, while current federal law does not protect the LGBT community, we live in a, in a community that's 60% LGBT. Um, is there any way, can we add bullets to there to clarify that, that that's something that will be important to our community? Um, I would say so. And I would rely on, uh, on y'all to perhaps provide some draft language to that effect because um, it's, it's, I think, something y'all are much more fluent in than, than I am. Um, so I would, I would welcome uh, your contribution there. Okay, we can get that to you. The, the missing information is just uh, typos and other things. We won't waste our time talking about that. You've identified that this is in process and you'll do it. Um, those, are the, those are the summary of the high points in the questions. Let me now open this up to my fellow commissioners. Additional questions, Kurali? Anyone? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I heard sort of an underlying sort of concern that, you know, we, we might run into some challenges with the bidding um, or with the responses, I should say. Um, can we level set on how serious that is? Is this just a question of you have to, um, kind of roused up the, the respondents? Or are we in the possible realm of having fewer responses or maybe very limited number of responses to the RFP? Well, um, I think there's a couple of reasons why there would be limited responses. One is over the past decade or so, there's been a consolidation in the concessionaire industry. The big boys have been buying up the medium-sized boys, so to speak. And so there are fewer possible um, major concessionaires to even bid on this. Um, the, Mr. Corcoran mentioned there were four uh, major concessionaires out hunting for um, local partners two years ago. And I would expect those four to, um, to be very interested and probably would propose. That would be a healthy competition in my mind to get three or four. Um, the, there are some smaller concessionaires um, that operate in, um, in California, um, High Flying Foods, for example. Um, so I will reach out directly to them. They did not come to the community outreach meeting two years ago. Um, so I can see what's up. And then there are some, some foreign, some other foreign based concessionaires that may be looking to get into the US market. And um, this could be an opportunity for them, but normally the ones that are coming in are, are, are so focused on the large hubs that they may not, um, that the, the part of their business plan may not be a US small hub. Um, so I think, yeah, there's gonna be a, the, 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 the response rate will probably be three or four. And that's similar to what it would have been in, in the boom time of 2019. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kevin, I'd like to follow up with David's question. Um, my expertise has been in shopping centers or in small uh, um, areas, not necessarily in airports. So, uh, but um, what is plan B? What is plan B if we have one person or two people or three, but two of them are obviously so behind in terms of uh, the uh, capabilities or the economic uh, success rate? Uh, what's, our, what's our plan then? 
and we've spent two and a half years and their end result is uh, inadequate supply uh, or inadequate demand. Um, do we have a backup? The, the, this, as part of the procurement process, and Kim can correct me if I got this wrong, but the city has the right to not choose anyone. So they don't, you're not compelled to say, take the, um, Take the one with the highest score. Say if 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 the proposal of all the proposals are docs. So, um, so then I, I I would defer to this to the city on what happens next. But I think the the process would be, you you stick with your incumbent for another year or two and and reboot the RFP process. So uh, I could speak on that. Um, I know that the current. Um, concessionaire that came in um, after host left PSP. Um, so Parodies is our current concessionaire that does our retail and our food and beverage. Um, I know that they would be very interested in staying. Um, they, have, they have a lot of ideas um, that they've presented and um, they've done a very great job at um, coming in and helping in the, the food and beverage side and bringing in Buzz by Barfly, PSP Coffee, and the Avanti units um, during the whole pandemic. Um, so I know that with their existing agreement, they would go to a month-to-month -month agreement um, and kind of a holding over period. Um, then we do have the opportunity to potentially sign another one, two, three year agreement, depending on what we decide and depending on what type of infrastructure they'd be willing to commit to. Like capital investment infrastructure that they'd be willing to commit to. What we don't know is, are they willing to incorporate local brands? I mean, this RFP, my hope is, will give them if them and all of all of the competition hosts and the others give them the opportunity to really fine tune what's most important to us and that is to make sure this airport reflects local brands local tastes and local vendors so um, i understand because of the pandemic and and some certain concessions that were offered um, we really weren't able to make that a priority but with this process we will and my hope is if if there is only one vendor and we're going to extend that that they will embrace the priorities we've talked about tonight. Um, but I guess we'll wait and see. Um, well, Kevin, <clears throat> Kevin, uh, uh, you know, the economic climate may not be there to embrace the local businesses as much as I think everyone would like to. Um, with rising interest rates and with rising inflation, um, I think the, we all have to look at, yes, all of us want to have a local flavor in the airport, but my experience has been with, like I said, other shopping areas um, is that unless the city or the airports willing to put in infrastructure dollars of their own to facilitate that, I think it's going to be a challenge for any concessionaire to take um, local businesses that are not financially sustainable by themselves and turn that into a profit that they're going to expect. And so I think we have to, we have to understand that going into this process um, because I just don't see the economics. I mean, I, I'm not sure what the economics are going to be in two years, but I think we have to keep that in the back of our minds. This has to be economically viable process um, and an economically viable product um, to make this successful at all, uh, especially for the airport. So that's. Peter. Peter. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with Commissioner Miller here uh, because I can tell you from my own personal conversations uh, with some of the people that were very, very interested some years ago. Uh, they don't have the appetite right now. And, and it's because of the pandemic, you know, they took an economic hit. And I don't think they, they really have the appetite, uh, nor the financial resources for the infrastructure. So myself, uh, I would expect that we will be very disappointed 
in the local participation. Let me just comment on the, so local participation can, can have different, um, it, can, it can have different uh, ways it's realized. <clears throat> so I think the, the purest form would be a, a, a local businessman actually operating his or her own store on airport property. That's one way. Um, at the end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum would be a licensing agreement so that you can have, you know, and I'm, I'm not gonna <laughs> name a, a real local one because I don't wanna uh, presuppose anything, but, but just have that brand, have that menu, probably, you know, um, uh, a limited version of the, of the real menu or a limited version of, of the stuff that's sold in a shop and have that be um, operated by a major concessionaire, but, but with a license agreement with a local. And then in between in that spectrum, you can have uh, partnerships, joint ventures. So say the lending can be based on the, the, um, you know, the, the, the balance sheet of the, uh, of the, of the major concessionaire and their access to capital and expertise um, in, in, and the local person can be a minority partner in that joint venture. So there, there's, a, there's a, a few different ways you can crack that nut and have local participation. Well, what, all of the participants that I had talked to in the past, they were all only interested in joint ventures. None of them uh, were going to go it alone. Um, still, they've lost appetite. Okay. Any other comments? Kevin? I was curious whether there, and this would be kind of a question for Harry to provide input, is whether that those CARES Act funds that we haven't quite decided what to do with could be involved in, in sort of helping these local uh, businesses receive capital to, to be involved in the concession bid? So the answer to that is uh, fundamentally, yes. Uh, there's a longer answer to that, but fundamentally, yes. Uh, Here's fund could be leveraged to, to help offset. Um, the way the language is crafted around the Here's Act um, it really puts an emphasis on terminal reconfiguration. Um, so you'd have to really look into how, uh, it, in what ways it can be applied uh, in that process. Um, so it's not a simple answer, but it's a yes, it, they could possibly be used. Well, Harry, one of the problems may be that we're helping the people that don't really need help. You know, if you put this out in this way, then uh, you still may not get the local participation, and then you basically are giving money away. That's a fair point. But, but I think Commissioner Weissman did a good, I think that's the kind of creative stuff that might be good, but I think, I think you know, and again, I'm off the wrong and I'm brand new and I haven't been in any of the discussions over the last two or three years, but I think the airport or the city um, are, are going to have to put in infrastructure dollars um, to help with these people. Um, I think our consultant, while very diplomatically saying it, is that we're still a small airport and, uh, and we may be growing and all of us think we're going to become a much bigger airport than we are now. And I think we are going to too, actually. But at this point, um, the future, I mean, these people don't necessarily look at it the same way. They say, what am I going to get in the next fiscal year? What am I going to get in the fiscal year after that? I mean, that's the hard numbers, the profit and loss statements and things of that nature. And I think my experience has been that the owner of the property um, has to usually put in infrastructure dollars. Now that may be infrastructure dollars 
and I'm not saying we have that money and I don't want to put Harry or anybody in a, in a bind, but um, you know, uh, there are infrastructure dollars you can use in terms of plumbing and electricity and gas and all the sorts of things that could be used no matter who the franchisee is. Um, and that could be used um, over and over and over again. So it's not a lost cause. Um, but I think those are some of the things that I think we're going to be forced with because I'm afraid that Peter's right. I, I think we're going to be disappointed at the end of this, just looking at the economic factors that we see in front of us now and some of the things we've discussed tonight on other topics. And I'm just scared that we should have discussions about that. Um, maybe that's a possibility we definitely should at least talk about, and especially with the city council, and um, you know, and and maybe contemplate. And uh, staff may have some great ideas on how we could use some infrastructure dollars to help soften the blow or entice. I like to think entice uh, uh, franchisees to to come in um, and uh, and do that. And because uh, it's all about the bottom line, it's all about the bottom line for them. I think. So oh, let's go to Kevin, then Peter. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, just wanted to respond to Peter's comments earlier that we may be, you know, throwing funds in people that don't really need it. And I, I guess I wonder if it might be feasible to limit that sort of infrastructure helping to uh, local joint ventures or, or you know, things of, of that matter where, where it's possible to not give away infrastructure to people that don't need it, but to give infrastructure to local brands that we'd like to get involved. Peter? Yes, I have a question for Molly. Uh, I mean, as unpopular as that may sound, but I think we heard a lot today uh, that may support extending the existing agreement maybe for a year or two. And uh, as Victoria said, maybe uh, they, these uh, uh, Paris, they, uh, can reach out to uh, local merchants, you know, to get participation so that we have some local participation uh, and yet um, give us some time because I think we, we've been seeing here that uh, we haven't clearly thought it through. Um, there are uh, uh, a few uh, uh, steps we still need to take. Other comments? Well, Raleigh, um, what's your reaction to this? And uh, would you, based on, on th these comments, would you proceed any, any differently? Um, so the recent discussion of what to do with the CARES Act money, I think is, um, is one that has already occurred to the, the team. Um, and it's a, it's, it's sort of a, a way of, okay, well, how do we, how do I, how do we identify what infrastructure improvement is appropriate? Um, and you know, non-discriminatory across um, the, the various tenants that we may have. Uh, on the timing issue, um, I I would say that this is this is a, this is a good opportunity for a concessionaire because your airport is growing and has basically already rebounded from the pandemic disruption to air traffic. Um, you've got airlines such as Southwest and JetBlue that you didn't have two years ago. So I'd say that this opportunity is overall more attractive than it was two years ago. It's just that the concessionaires may not be in the same um, state of health and confidence that they were. Um, they had been enjoying a decade of untrammeled success from the Great Recession up to the pandemic. And that usually doesn't happen in aviation. There's usually regular disruptions. So I think that 
that decade of, of growth kind of um, created almost a bubble in terms of how much they were willing to spend on, on capital improvements. Um, and so that, 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 that has gone down and I think the business model is shifting and it will be different. It will have shifted whether or not this is postponed zero months, 12 months or 24 months. Um, I, I don't think there's a time at the end of it where the concessionaires will say, let's start spending a lot, of, a lot more. Um, and indeed, I, mean, I think they're getting less for their money than they used to because of the supply chain disruptions and then the cost of, of construction labor. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, um, we have right now, I think a $400 per square foot minimum in the RFP. And um, I was on a call Tuesday, yesterday, uh, where um, two major concessionaires were talking about $1,800 a square foot for food and beverage, which is, um, which is frightening. <laughs> it's hard to make the numbers work when it's that high. Mm -hmm. So I would say go forward, but I'm an advocate for this stuff. Um, I, you know, I, 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 um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think that I'm not just blowing smoke. This is an attractive airport uh, for a concessionaire to do business. For what it's worth, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I, Scott, Peter, I'm humbled by, by your advice in this thing. And I think it's important to think about it. But considering the growth we've had, I hate to give up on this prior, at least to see how the market reacts to this. I mean, we saw the enthusiasm that was generated in this community when hosts and parodies and others started to partner with people. And most of those folks were either licensing or some sort of a joint deal. That was what was coming to us, those types of partnerships. And I just hate to see us back away from that. Let's see what the market will, will bear, especially considering the success we've had as an airport. Um, and I just think if these vendors are creative, there's a lot of folks, a lot of local folks who are looking to partner with these folks and see. And if we find out through this process that it's just unrealistic for all the reasons that were implied earlier in your comments, then we can always back away and lessen the priority in terms of that having local representation in the selection criteria. But I hate to see us abandon that now or just to extend the contract without giving it a good effort because we saw how close we came in 19 and let's see if we can do it again. So let me ask you, uh, Raleigh, based on that, can you incorporate all these comments and then come back to us with a revised proposal that we can look at again? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, I think it's um, so um, uh, the procurement uh, department is, is kind of driving the bus on this. That's that's Kim, who's on this call as well. And um, and so it's 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 uh, I guess it, it's it's her document, not mine. Um, but we are all um, helping edit it and improve it. And we will um, obviously take <laughs> these many comments and, and, and suggestions and, and make make the RFP clearer and better. Great. Harry, any other comments before we wrap this up? No additional comments. All right. Thank you all for your time to read it, for your offering the questions. Raleigh and team, Kim, thank you for providing your insights. We'll look forward to the next round. This is important to us. This is one of our two priorities for the city. So please keep us in the loop and uh, we'll, I promise to communicate to all the commissioners um, next steps once we hear some feedback from you guys. Do, thank yeah. you all. Thank you. Thank you, Raleigh. Thank, thanks all for your patience in that conversation. Um, it's time now for commissioner requests reports. Do we have any commissioner requests and, and reports? Um, I was, again, because um, Commissioner Payne can't talk <laughs> um, or can't be heard. <laughs> he can talk. <laughs> um, can't be heard. Um, that uh, he thought we were going to start listing the uh, committee meetings um, on the agenda, um, the actual dates as they became available. And so I wanted to find out or, and I'm interested in that as well. So I'm wondering, um, is there a way we can start listing the committee dates on the committee uh, portion, the four, 
on agenda number 14 and um, when those dates are currently um, so that we all know when committees are meeting. I know that is listed in 14A, the committee meetings. Um, Harry, were we ready to share the dates under that, uh, that item 14A? Um, Harry, I can speak to that. That um, Vice Chairman Corcoran and Commissioner Miller, that was actually my oversight. Um, I had that prepared for the agenda, but I did not add that on. I apologize. I will make sure that it is on the agenda for the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. And I will, I, I'll, I'll send out that list to the commissioners at the end of this meeting. That would be perfect. Thank you. Then uh, I won't get killed by Commissioner Payne. Thank you. <laughs> That's why it was on the agenda. All good. All right. Any other comments? Commissioner request reports. Okay. Harry, we send it over to you. City Council actions. Uh, the only city council actions are on a consent agenda, and that's for um, the Lamar agreement. Um, that is to extend their agreement for one year. I think we briefed the commission about that, I want to say, two meetings ago. Um, and we expect that to fly through with, with no issues. So that's the only thing we've got uh, in addition to now, I guess, uh, what the commission approved in this meeting, which is the airline incident. Got it. Uh, we have the uh, item 13, air, air, airline re, uh, activity reports are included. Um, and future committee meetings, Christina is going to send that out. So you'll have that. Are there any other issues or topics that we need to talk about tonight? Uh, uh, ju just one, um, Kevin. Um, I'll, I'll be working with uh, Christine. We'll set up a meeting, a meeting of the operations committee, um, go out to members with uh, potential dates that, that people can get back to us on so that we can meet on the uh, issue of, of clear as well as parking. Thank you. And David, I know that the budget committee is scheduled to meet on March 1st. Is that correct, David Feldman? Yeah, that's correct. And um, based on feedback of the committee, I think you can expect to see regular meetings of the budget committee thereafter, and we'll be scheduling those with staff and members of the committee. Great. Uh, Vice Chairman Corcoran, actually, I misspoke. Um, the future committee meetings is on page 47 of the agenda packet. Okay, it's in the agenda packet. It is. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's been a long meeting. Thank you all for your time and effort. Is there anything else before I ask for an adjournment? Yeah, I want to say thank you, Kevin, for running the meetings again. You do a great job, and um, you know we really appreciate it, uh, or I appreciate it as a commissioner uh, for the excellent job you're doing. Thank you, thank you, and hopefully Optop will be back with us next month. But uh, thanks for your preparation, for your time, and uh, does somebody want to wrap this meeting up for us? Move to adjourn. Second. 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 All right. All right. We'll adjourn. We'll see you all on March 16th at 5:30. Thank you all. Good night, Have everyone. A good Thank you.